Okay, hello, good afternoon everyone. Thank you for coming to Turn Gallery to um, listen to Blue Curry, who's the solo artist right now in the show, Leisure Aesthetics, speaking with Dr. Ian Bethel Bennett from University of the Bahamas. So I'll just do a quick intro and then I will leave them to it. Blue Curry, who's right here, um, is born in the Bahamas and he's an artist working primarily in sculptural assemblage and installation art who uses an idiosyncratic language of commonplace objects and fan materials to engage with themes of exoticism, tourism, and material culture. He's exhibited at the Tate Britain, the Victoria and Albert Museum, Liverpool, Site Santa Fe, Liverpool Biennial, I think that is, and the Jamaica Biennials, the Caribbean Triennial, and the Art Museum of the Americas. It's Okay, I'm gonna keep going. It's a very long list of museums where he's exhibited, so I'm gonna stop there. Most recently was at Tate Britain and also at Documenta, which happens every five years in Kassel um, in a collaborative project with Alice Yard from Trinidad. Um, he is a graduate of Goldsmiths College for MFA program, and he's currently living in London and works between London and the Caribbean. He's also the director of Ruby Cruel, a creative space in Hackney, London. And he will be speaking with Dr. Ian Bethel Bennett, who's an associate professor of English and social studies at University of the Bahamas. Um, Dr. Bethel Bennett's research includes uh, is specifically about gender and development and migration and his recent publications focus on unequal development in the Caribbean particularly in the Bahamas and Puerto Rico where tourist resorts take over land and so disenfranchise locals. He works around Haitian and Cuban migration and through the Bahamas and is currently working on a project on statelessness in the Bahamas. He writes quite a lot for many of our publications locally and daily newspapers and scholarly journals on gender and development. And with that, I will leave these two to have a conversation. So thank you both for being here. This is your mic. And because the mic is directional, we have to be <laughs> intentional. Directional and intentional. I'll try to be, uh, uh, I think you have to, how close does it have to be to one's mouth? No? That looks good. Great. Okay. So, well, th thanks. Thank for, you for coming out. And can everyone hear us uh, from from here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're good. So, so Blue and I got together earlier today to talk about. Identity politics, I guess, and which is not what we're, which is not what we're talking today. about here. Yeah. And one of the points that came up that really we did not hit on was this behind us, because I think this is really where we could 
jump off and you can jump into the deep end if you like and swim <laughs> <laughs> sure well i guess i wanted to include this slide because this is a, a an ad that's on the road quite near the gallery um and is very typical of the way we see uh the bahamas advertise and it it just um projects this notion that uh that island spaces uh, uh are unsophisticated uh, so why would you advertise sophisticated island living uh, like aren't we so uh, therefore we must not be sophisticated if you if you follow the the thinking and therefore that 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 that, that people from the islands aren't sophisticated that we're just these crumbs of land off of the continents and uh, are lesser than. And I think that that's a, that is just something that is, uh, that's gone on since colonial times, continues to happen. And it affects us. It's a, it's, um, it's a complex that we have as, uh, as uh, islanders. Um, so this, so, so uh, seeing this uh, just reminded me and, and confirms a lot of what I get into with the, with the show itself. And it's interesting that you picked that up because I picked it up the same time and I had been out here a lot. You know, the island is divided into these sectors and we don't often see the sectoral development of the island because we inhabit or we tend to inhabit one space. So because I've been out here so much, not here physically, but out on the western side, you see different things than you would see out east or in, in the center where I am. And it suddenly occurred to me, and Amanda drew it to my attention the other night, I was down there photographing the, the signs, that sophistication is one thing, but the way space is developed is completely anachronistic and completely asymmetrical. Like the way we have notions of space in terms of the tropes and just as you say sophisticated island living why is the island highlighted and why is the sophisticated highlighted and what does that tell us about an aesthetic of islands i don't know if you want to tackle that one no <laughs> well no, no, no i mean that's uh, that's uh, exactly it that the the the, the island space um like what I'm getting into with the work is that um, the island space can only be seen in terms of leisure. Right. So like this is a place where Westerners come to drop out of thinking, out of, they, there's a, a belief that there's no intelligent thought happening here. Uh, this is paradise. This is, so all of the, 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 the ideas of, uh, it's kind of, drop out and go to the islands or this mm -hmm. um if we remember there was a, a campaign for the bahamas some years back of this uh you come to the bahamas to reinvent yourself right, so this right. is a space where people come to be something other and that and that is this othering of the islands that always happens when really we're all from different places and most of us are you but in this island space we need to be othered and we need to be consumed because nobody goes on vacation to to go to the place they already know they need to feel like they're having this other experience um, and it's almost a parallel universe yeah and then what happens as we've discussed a lot we have learned to perform that yeah like and we we perform that um that other otherness and um, if you look at, like, for example, I've done the, this series of um, name badges, uh, which are alternative uh, uh, name tags for uh, people, say, working in the service industry, um, which say things like exotic, authentic, native, other, and colonial. And, and so these expectations are what uh, uh, visitors usually come to the islands the Caribbean in particular, and that's the way that they want to consume us. So they don't want to see, for example, intelligence uh, or, 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 you know what I mean, like more or uh, intellectual or, or even with me and my own art career, having a conceptual art practice 
doesn't fit in at all with the expectations of Caribbean art. Mm. And so that's always been a struggle for me. But because so, you know, in a sense, I am looking at all of these topics because I also get trapped by them. And the traps, so the, the traps are interesting because often you don't, one does not realize one is being trapped in an identity that is not necessarily one's own until we step out of that space and, and come into one of the three islands on the floor, which are very interestingly placed within an aesthetic that I would like you to, to, <laughs> to jump into. The thing about, um, the, I mean, discussing the, the, the sculptures uh, which are on the floor, which I, these floor-based pieces, uh, I call them islands. So they're using the materials that, are, uh, that we're quite familiar with that are associated with tourism, with the touristic experience, but then using them sculpturally. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, discuss, I, I, I call them islands because uh, I've, thought a lot about sculpture as an island and um, if you follow me here that growing up on an island it's a unique uh, sort of situation because as you go in a boat get, go out to sea you can see the entire landmass that you live on so you can see the place you live as an object Whereas if you live in a landlocked place, you never get that vantage point. So, so what happens is it, it's, I noticed in my own sculptures over years that I always wanted to be able to circumnavigate. Them. Mm. And so then when you stop and you think, well, why do I think that all sides of a sculpture need to be seen? And it's because I've grown up being able to circumnavigate the island islands that I've lived on. And so, so there's, uh, the, there is this um, uh, idea that I have of, of sculpture as an island. So I've placed them on the floor and, um, and uh, yeah, they become these islands that can move, they're interchangeable, and there are many of them. Um, I can't remember the question, but that was uh, sort of, I, do you follow what I mean? That, this, that, um, that, and and that, in that ob objectification of, of us as islands, that, that, that is part of, the whole thing is that this idea of the fantasy island and and being stranded on an island and these ideas they're they're multiple and it's all about the island space and uh, and it doesn't happen in the same way on a continent and a, and a bigger place so I would say okay and then that becomes problematic on a, in a place like Britain because Britain is still an island. And then you have the island of Ireland oh, over there, where it's a different type of island. But then it's bigger. So I'm talking about like our, our like in the Caribbean, we have, you know, like in the Bahamas, 700 rocks, islands, keys, you know, that, that it's, uh, it's when you can, you know, I, I grew up mostly on an island that was a mile and a half long. So I knew the perimeter and the shoreline of that, and I knew that entire space. And I think few people can say that they physically know the entire space that they grew up in. Like, I mean, you might know if you lived in America in some way, place like Iowa, you might know your streets and your neighborhoods, but then that just keeps expanding. Whereas, yeah, here you can, you can really know, you, you know the space intimately. Um, and, and so somehow I think that that, does inform the sculpture that I make. Um, yeah. See, I, I identify with that really easily because I grew up so much on Harbor Island. And for, a, for years, that was, we went to Harbor Island almost every weekend or Exuma. And, and then suddenly we couldn't go to Exuma because the drug lords had taken over. So we went almost exclusively to Harbor Island and that, the development of Harbor Island has meant that it is now designed out of my family's ability to, to be there in a lot of ways. I wonder if you could speak to that because you talk about the geographies of, and that hasn't happened on Spanish wells. I don't think it's, well, okay, it's beginning to. <laughs> hmm. 
I don't know if you could speak to that a little bit. I I haven't been to Spanish Wells in a long time. Well, well I mean, the, the in the case of Harbor Island, like that, I mean, it's an, it's an interesting one. Like when you go now, it is, it's, uh, it's what I call leisure aesthetics. Yes. Uh, yeah. To the max. I mean, yeah. it is like a design book. If you open a book on yes. Caribbean living, it is that. So no Bahamian can recognize it, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and there are a few uh, a few uh, books out there that I that I that I have in my own collection. And you look through these these books of um, that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It's like being vanquished by the light. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. But, um, but, but it, it, it becomes this aesthetic that is about seaside living and barefoot, you know, like, so it, it's a Westerner's version of how one should live in the Caribbean. And so whereas I'm kind of looking through this book and thinking, well, you know, my forefathers were shipwrecked on a reef here and had to come and live in a cave and, you know, and um, but here she is barefoot living and collecting driftwood on the, on the beach. And this is not, this is not the, it, it's, it's not the history of this place and it does not, right. It's a way of consuming and, uh, and it's a very generic way of, um, of, of simplifying the culture. And that's where I, I get into the, a lot of the visuals that I work with because they, they, um, uh, they, they just gloss over the, the, the histories and the sophistication mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. places in the Caribbean and the Caribbean being the first melting pot in the world where people met and mixed and, um, and, and cultures kind of um, stewed. Right. And when you were saying that and you talked about the size of the island, what immediately sprung to mind after Harbor Island was Sabre or Saba. Okay. Because, I don't know if you've flown over. I haven't. No. So it's like this thing that, as the Bahamians, my, my kids would say, jokes out of the water. And it just, it's like this pyramid that comes up like that. And it's like, how do people stay on that thing? How do they not fall off? And then so your your mind is constantly going because it's it just sticks out. It's a mountain. And but they have a thriving population. So again, when we think of space and the the, the aesthetic, it's interesting to me when you talk about the leisure aesthetic, how you design those three spaces on the floor, those three islands, but they don't touch. Yeah, they come. Well, they they, they, <laughs> they come close to they, they come close to it <laughs> to touching. But in different in other configurations, they are more lined up and and, and together. They do they, they can shift around. So I mean, I'm just using you know the the, the, the modernist motif of the square and uh, and and the grid and, and working. Which I think that. works great. Hmm. I I would like you to talk about it a little bit. <laughs> What? Why the islands don't? Well, they, they do. They do come together. Um, okay. Yeah. So the square. Okay. <laughs> cool. But mm -hmm. in life between islands, which the show you were are in at the Tate, in at, the, the, yeah. at the Tate, how does that work? Like, mm. what the works that were in that yeah. show? Um, but I think they, they they'll flash up here eventually. Um, but uh, how does it work in terms of the, the life between islands? Oh. I love I love the the title. Yeah. Well, the, well, well life between islands uh, was a show um, organized by Tate Britain, which um, uh, talks about uh, British artists um, or uh, who are of Caribbean descent. Mm -hmm or Caribbean people who have lived in Britain. So it's this uh, movement back and forth of ideas and, uh, and physical movement between um, the Caribbean and, and Britain. And so I, I moved to London uh, over 20 years ago and have been back and forth between the Bahamas and there and, and, and the wider Caribbean. So I, uh, that, 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 it kind of, when, they, when they approached me about the show, it, it pretty much described what I've been doing uh, uh, for for quite some time, um, 
but the uh, yes, and the and the, the works that were in the show, again in the same way, use these um, materials of tourism and the cliches of the Caribbean um, to create what are kind of uh, conceptual modern works of art, mm -hmm. um, but using techniques and and materials we're really we're we're familiar with. Um, and, uh, the techniques that we're familiar with. Well, for example, the the I, I work with a, a giant palm leaf, right? Um, which and, is Caribbean. Which um, then has um, a, I've through it I've um, I've uh, woven cassette tape through the palm leaf, and so that's very much borrows from uh, stitching raffia into into straw bags mm -hmm. and, and and that sort of tradition and the palm leaf itself is is that material so it's just a take on a a, a native handicraft uh, you know in, in the bahamas which is its own art form as well but then i've just worked with it in my own way um it might pop up when it, when it pops up. yeah it did pop up it popped up right okay <laughs> Let's keep yeah yeah so the so the palm leaf piece um it, the cassette tape uh ah oh yeah this is the piece uh caribbean queen so the so it's it's cassette tape that's been woven through uh every single part of the palm front uh to make this pattern and the cassette tape is uh using the song um uh, billy ocean's caribbean queen mm. so it's on there about 13 times so it's specifically that song. So if you took all of the cassette tape off and put it together again, you would get a very garbled version of Caribbean Queen. So conceptually, I'm very strict with that sort of thing. So yes, I had a studio full of Billy Ocean Caribbean Queen tapes, which I found in markets and on eBay. And um, so because it has, so what I'm saying is that that idea of the of the Caribbean Queen that that Billy Ocean is singing about, you know. She's a sexy woman, you know. She seduced me. It's it's all of that stuff that that also feeds into these ideas, the wider ideas of the Caribbean that are not as sophisticated as I would like to see them be. So then it, I just use that as a material. So the the song itself is is just uh, employed as a as a material in the in the sculpture. Which I think is another brilliant aspect of the multiple or the multi-layered and resonating meanings that you you bring to the to the practice, but also that we're avoiding the flattening of the Caribbean into this. Well, as Friedman says, the, the world is flat, but is it really, or is it just that the way he sees the world is flat, and the fact that the globalized market makes us presume that because somebody's million dollars can go from one bank account to the next in a day, that the world is flat. But your experience is uh, showing that it's not. I mean, your whole practice is showing that it's actually not flat. It's, it's multiverse. Well, yeah, I, mean, I think I'm following you. Uh, <laughs> Well, because we get flattened out by globalization, right? We do. Yeah. Well, that's. I mean, that 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 is what. Well, we we are complicit in it, or at least our governments uh, in the promotion of tourism um, quite happily flatten us out into a few key uh, uh, acute. Uh, uh, um, uh, they're happy to um, to uh, bring us down to a few stereotypes. Um, uh, because those are many of them are still what uh, we're projecting uh, during colonial times. If we go back to old postcards and many of those postcard images, we're still recreating in tourism mm -hmm. ads mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think the way I might be going off in another direction, but just uh, I'll, I'll I'll go there. Um, but when I started out uh, working at home um, in art, I was a photographer. Right. So I was doing black and white photography, working a lot in the dark room, and um, uh, I did a lot of street photography. So I created a whole body of work uh, that was. Um, oh, I, I, I created a whole body of uh, of work, which I had two shows, did really well. Um, but when I 
backed off from the work and looked at it and tried to understand like why is this so successful and i realized that i was recreating colonial imagery okay. so i was taking photographs of boys diving off of the dock into the water and if you go back into postcards this is the postcard images of boys diving for coins off of ships and and so here it is i am a bahamian i've lived here my whole life but i had consumed the imagery that was out there of us which was all promotional imagery so i then took a giant step back and even i was othering the black body you know like it was uh, it was really a copy of um of, of the way we had already been portrayed. So that's when I knew, that's when my own interrogation of, uh, of how, how could that happen to me? How could I be duped into, into this? But there are a few other images. It's still... The market is very alluring. It is. I mean, that's what it, that's what it does. That very And it, it goes into everything. It permeates every aspect of our lives but we don't see that but you somehow you step back out of it and you saw it hmm. like so earlier i think it was earlier this year i was teaching a class on bahamian culture and i used blues work um that was up there a minute ago um which one the caribbean queen and then the airline seats um and i was asking my students what they thought of this and how they would how they related to this and everybody in the class except one came back with the same tourism slogans hmm. but they couldn't see that they were they had swallowed everything hook line and sinker and it was interesting that their narrative was flat like there was no interrogation of the fact that their identities their lives their experiences were so different from everything else that they see or that we are supposed to be so, what you're saying they saw themselves through the tourist they lens saw themselves the through the tourist lens you know the frame had been very successful in the way it captured them yeah but but i mean we're 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 kind of we, we we grow up in in the culture and you know one of like being nice to the tourist and performing certain duties and you can attend bahama host and become a good bahama host and all of these things i mean i i worked in a hotel for two years at the, at the uh, former crystal palace hotel um, and for example, when I, of course, that's a like firsthand experience of what tourists expect. And, and um, yeah, it was, it's shocking for the most part. So I think that was, it was quite a, a, a wake up call um, when, you, when you see what people thought was going to happen, happen in the Bahamas and then how much of a, they really thought it was Disneyland. Like you would have, um, yeah, like for example, guests, our guests came, the family, they stayed for a week. It rained the whole week. They wanted a refund because it rained the whole week. And you just left and they were very, very serious, very serious. And so it's like, so again, the Bahamas is this uh, fantasy space that just is here to provide good times, positive experience. I mean, like, like we know it, it rains here, you know, we, we have a dump. Um, the power gets cut off, but never at the hotels. You know, it's uh, so. I, you know, uh, I think I went in a different direction. But no, no. Uh, I mean, I think that's a great direction to go in because mm -hmm. it's actually speaking to what we're what we're saying. I mean, there uh, there is a there is a fiction that is sold that we consume and we then perpetuate. Mm -hmm. So we enclose our, or we imprison ourselves in the same fictions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you find it. I, I find it all the time that like you'll you'll be in a line somewhere talking to someone. They'll complain about, oh, I don't have power. I don't have this. Mm -hmm. I don't have that. And then they just round it up by saying, 
but the Bahamas is the most beautiful place in the world and the best place to live. And, and so, and that, and that's what I, that, that is just where we consume the advertising. So like, I mean, it is curious. I mean, I, I know that you and I are very interested in, in the image and promotion um, aspects, but even to go drive around now and like, why, why do we have um, ads up showing a policeman saying, you know, like, it's something like it's great to be Bahamian or proud to be Bahamian. I'm proud to be Bahamian. Yeah. I, I, you know, it, it, it's sort of, um, yeah, it, it, you, you don't need to be told whether either you're proud to be Bahamian or you're not. But I think that this, this idea when people say to you, but the Bahamas is the most beautiful place in the world. It's like, well, no, that's what the ads say. You know, it's okay to be critical of the Bahamas. It is, it, that's fine. Um, and my, my criticality with the work and with even saying something like this comes out as people saying to me, why are you so negative? And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not negative. I mean, it is fine to, to, to look at these aspects and I, the Bahamas is a very beautiful place, but it's, but when people say that they're just trying to, they're, they're fooling themselves in a, in a way, but they, they're just repeating what they've. Because that fiction is so pervasive and so important. We want to latch onto that. And we want to live that fiction. And that is a challenge because it's not real. But we have constructed it into reality. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that, that, that's, too, um, that's almost too Freudian. No, no, and, no, it, no. I mean, it is, it, it is what, uh, in a way, we, we, can, we, we, are consume, we consume the very advertising that we put out there. So, like, I mean, yeah, as a boy, you could be watching, well, all right, I'm a little older, satellite television. Um, <laughs> and and you're, wa you're sitting in your home and you're watching an advert about the Bahamas and it's showing you all of the things. And, 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 and so in a way, you start to consume the very image of how you're supposed to be in the Bahamas or how, like, you know, it, 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 and, and this... Um, uh, I feel like you, you 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 see it all the time that we like it's almost like people want to be on holiday like mm -hmm. that that they're also um, I mean we say it all the time it's like oh you you're playing tourists uh, you know like and it um, which playing tourists is a great you know like that's a that's a great statement but you hear it all the time but but you see um, folks from the out islands come in and stay for a week at Atlantis and this to me just seems like a nightmare like like why would you why why would you want to go into that environment um but i think that it is a, a partially that this you know like that the, the the tourists are having such an amazing time here that they can live this other bahamas that you know um and that they get to do that for a week i, I don't know i mean i'm i maybe you can unpick that but it's um I think yeah. maybe, yeah. <laughs> just yeah it's it's the air conditioning and the water park and the, yeah, the fact that the electricity doesn't go off and the fact that you, you can actually walk in and somebody will serve you as opposed to you having to, to prepare all the meals. And, you know. So it, it's like you, you, you suspended reality. That's, I, I think that's how we have to look at it. And you triggered something to, to step out for a second and look back at the, the conch shells. You triggered something because you talked about islands. And I don't. I know that a lot of the young people don't remember that there were so many conch shells that they basically filled in a part of the foreshore with a conch shell island. That because we had consumed, or people had consumed, so many conchs, but there was no interrogation of what that meant in the way that we inhabit the space, in the way that we inhabit the, that part of the fiction either. And I thought, when I saw your island of conchs the other night, I thought about that and how these become, in a way, the landmass that we, that we walk on. Sure. I mean, I, I, when, whenever they, I show these uh, the strobing conch works uh, outside um, of the Bahamas, it's all about how exotic the shells are. And that is that... Um, that that that's really it's um, and a lot of what I'm doing I'm very interested in the exotic and how moving one place 
something from one place to the other mm -hmm. immediately makes it exotic or taking an object into the white gallery space mm -hmm. exoticizes it. So this, or even uh, working with objects from say the 1950s, there's a temporal exoticism. Mm -hmm. So I, I love to push all of that together in a work, but the conch shells always um, kind of bring people uh, to think about the, these ideas of the holiday vacation. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm very quick to oh, say to them that like, well, I'm a sculptor. I'm from the Bahamas. These are my natural materials. So I'm not always necessarily talking about the exotic if I'm using a conch shell. My grandmother propped open this, the front door with a conch shell and, and my uncle built walls out of conch shells. Mm -hmm. So what you're talking about that, yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and so it it then becomes this uh, this thing that that um, you know uh, why am I always working with these materials? And it's like, well, if you're from Italy, you work with marble because that's what's locally available to you. And the same, if you live in Germany in a forest, you'll make wooden mm -hmm. sculptures. But mm -hmm. why is it that if I want to use the resources available to me, which may some of them may be natural resources like the sand? Or the shells, and other others aren't natural, but they are the, the 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 materials that are to hand, which are from the tourism industry. Why can't I just use those in uh, freely? You know, you, do, you, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. So I have a, I have an ongoing personal project which will never be seen, but I take photographs at art fairs of things like it's got a coconut in it, or it's got a golf ball, or it's got a flamingo, but because it was made by like a white French guy in, this, in, in, in like the Pyrenees, it's considered like super avant-garde. But if as a Bahamian or a Caribbean artist use that material, somehow you're like, oh yeah, that's just native people. So, and there's so much of it when you start looking for it, when you go through like international fairs or whatever, or museums, you start seeing that use of use of materials that are native to us or native to our environment, but they're being used kind of ironically. Um, and it's kind of okay if you're not from the place. And that's something you, you do see a lot of. So I love that you're claiming that basically, you're claiming those materials for, for ourselves. Sorry. No, no, I think we should open it up for anybody who wants to say anything at any point comments please i don't know if there is space for people to ask from online or there is thank you okay but the i mean when you go into the the theory in terms of art theory and cultural theory it's interesting the way the theoretical frameworks work within the representation of cultural artifacts and cultural the materiality of culture you know, we hate to talk about theory because it, it excludes, but it actually breaks down sometimes in terms of the way the aesthetic challenges the non-aesthetic or the daily use, as Alice Walker talks about in when she talks about quills and the fact that these were for daily, for everyday use. Mm -hmm. This is what our lives are. So in um i don't know in long key in southern bahamas a lot of the old now abandoned town is made from limestone and conch shells but it's abandoned and because you know history moves things from one place to the next with with the industrial revolution steamships end and something else begins and so how do we stop i'm not asking you to answer this but how do we stop ourselves from becoming irrelevant when the trend changes how do we remain relevant thinking of this using our everyday aspects and what happens when for example those don't they aren't available every day you know can you can you say anything about that <laughs> well I, don't I, kill me I, I, no, I mean I'm, I'm trying to think. Like when I've done my own writing on the on the topic, it's kind of like, well, if we're only going to be judged on the superficial, so on the beauty of the Bahamas, which you know we we know it's amazing, then 
you know, if those things start to disappear, then what is the the interest that people will will have in in coming to a place like this? Imagine sea levels rise, um, beaches disappear. I mean, these things can happen. And and you're right. Then the only industry or the the the, the only industry we can really survive on right now is tourism. <laughs> so uh, so I I agree. It's like a like is that not the um, but it's been constructed into being the only industry we can survive oh, yes. on. Yes, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I mean that. That's where I, I, I get into. If we actually acknowledge that intelligent thought, uh, um, invest in our people, invest in education. I mean, because right now it's great that uh, we we need thousands of workers for hotels. So if we put too much education into no, honestly, we put too much education into into the population. Most people would aspire to hire, you know. But the government, I do believe, the government there's an amount that will go into education because you wouldn't want all of your people to leave or to open businesses because then we'd be like the Cayman Islands, which yes, has to yes. import thousands of predominantly Filipino workers mm -hmm. to service their, to their, for their service industry. So, I mean, you might, it, it, but I do think there, there are certain reasons why, we, you know, if we weren't dependent on tourism, like go to a place like Trinidad mm -hmm. that has oil money, Trinidad's culture is a hundred times richer than ours. We have a rich culture, but Trinidad people are performing and doing, and they're not doing it for an outside audience. They're doing it for intern, like for Trinidadians and internally. So I mean, I see you might um, have something to say about that. But the, but, the, but I, but I, but I, that was one thing in the time I spent in Trinidad. I'm, I was always so envious. They have tourists, but they do not bow to the tourists, and they do not let big developers come in and do the things that the well, developers do. I was going to ask you about that because Carnival was produced for tourism after it was created by Trinis. So, I mean, Carnival was a, a domestic or a local, you know, these local terms are troublesome, but it was an indigenous form mm -hmm. that was used indigenously or internally, and then it was taken into a tourist space to attract people into but but, but trinis didn't but, buy but, into but it, that but it, but it's still exactly like if you go to carnival in trinidad i've been three times you are looking at it's yeah. it's an inter-caribbean yep. thing yes like there are very very few tourists like yeah I, I mean i would take a flight in from london and you'd imagine the day before carnival that flight would be full no, no. not full it, they, it really is not um, uh, so what I'm saying is they don't have to perform for a foreign audience, so their cultural expressions are more genuine and they, they go in, in, in all sorts of directions. But and whereas, I'm agreeing with you. Whereas, <laughs> whereas in the Bahamas, for example, if something new starts, we have to lock that down and sell it to the tourists. And that's a bit what, what happened to the fish fry. Like fish fry started, you know, after, you know, Potter's Key had its issues. Fish fry kind of started in the side over here, and then it had to be kind of gentrified. Put the police station there. Let's make it look like this or that. Fish fry still has its character, but now it it got locked into that because now if you look, you can go online and it it'll tell you how to go and enjoy Nassau's fish fry. And once that happens, it can't change a lot because if the tourists don't show up and find twin brothers and and these things like so what i'm saying is that like in a way we keep see see see, see 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 i mean it's like going to puerto rico and going to loisa uh, because in loisa okay lo, están los negros see sí, yeah. yeah the the negros are in loisa but they have escaped the enclosure and they are everywhere on the island yeah. but we don't see that because this is the the spatial of the exotic and as you are leaving San Juan to go to Louisa, you have piñones and you have the, you know, the fish fry or the, the seafood part that people go to. But it's remained indigenous for the most part. I mean, a lot of it has been the, what, it, what, what was it? The sophisticated. Oh, oh. 
<laughs> All right. Olympics. Right. So you have these spaces within the very normal offerings where there is this white billowing curtain. And I mean, if I rent my property, I have to have it looking like an, a sophisticated island style because that's what people want. So, you know, how do we how do we coexist? Can we coexist without becoming schizophrenic? With, with what you mean, the expectation? The expectation this, and the and. Well, it, it's um, I, I, uh, the, the 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 problem is is that like well, I found as an artist throughout my career is that I don't get support from the government in any way because the work doesn't represent the Bahamas in their eyes. So now if you're a certain type of painter or you work in junk and new arts or uh, the money is there and it always has been. But so what the, the problem is, is that you if you're not going to fit exactly what the tourist brochure is mm -hmm. advertising the place as there's no interest in supporting you. So that mm -hmm. those but those are the new shoots that come up that will be the new culture. And yeah. that's that's always with my work what I'm on about that. It's like um, like the cement mixer that I made years mm -hmm. ago, which is painted blue, and it's just filled with sun sun cream. And I, it oh yeah, this piece. That, that, wow, that was good. <laughs> so I, but I, you know, I just say basically like, what kind of culture can you build out of sun cream? That I mean, it sounds very basic, but like you, you're you there there there's nothing that so you you have to. These restrictions is that the the it's a what uh, the show is it recently and described as as, as structural violence mm -hmm. of, of, it of is. tourism but, that, yeah that, um, and that's a bit where the this the video that I um which I, I produced for the show which features uh, the man who uh, took a sledgehammer to um uh, the statue of Columbus at, at government house um, but. I don't, uh, yes, that was at the same time as kind of the Black Lives Matters movement and people were destroying statues. But I see him, he's, he is just trying to free himself and us from this pristine expectation that people will come to the top of that hill, photograph that statue, get back on their cruise ship and go. And so from, so I know it's a very complicated action, uh, what he's doing there, but I, I see it mostly as not um, it, as, um, uh, yeah. I, um, so, I mean, this is always one of my problems. It, and I, it's not really my problem. It's a challenge that is that is thrown up constantly. I don't mind if I have to produce pretty art, but that's not what I'm going to do. I'm producing stuff that I live with daily. Like I am talking to the people who live around me. They may not see that, but that's that's what my conversation is about. So when this guy was, you know, committing violence on Columbus, we were in Canada, and it it just it was like. All of a sudden, everybody had it at the same time. And then the song came out right away afterwards. And that said to me that there was a lot of thought going into what was going on on the ground. Mm -hmm. Even though we are constantly told that we're not producing anything, we are not producing culture. Mm -hmm. Culture is always being produced. But it's not necessarily the culture, like you say, that the government will... will put on a brochure because it's not pretty it's not quaint it's not Yeah, it's it, it again. It's a flattening. It's a flattening of who we are, and and not by the external. It's by the well. That's a whole other complicated discussion, but that we don't have because it. We see that we want heads in beds, yeah. and asses on chairs. 
or sitting in planes that we don't actually benefit from. Yeah. So it's interesting to me that, and I'm going to go off on a tangent for one second, the whole green discussion in many ways elides us. It elides what we, how we live here because we live fairly green. Are you joking? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean... I am. I'm actually really joking. Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, but we can, are I, living I, as green as we can with no, the limitations okay. that we. Have. So, uh, apologize for that reaction. But, but no, I mean, I, I, I think it's. I, I, I mean, I, 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 you know, I, I can't remember the last thing I heard the at some summit the prime minister saying, "Oh, of course, you know, the Bahamas is here suffering. We're going to go underwater because of what the Western nations are doing, and the pollution is like." We can't recycle a single, maybe some click bottles. Like we can't recycle a thing. Like we can't talk the talk and be like, "Oh no, we're not, we are the, the, we set the dump on fire." That's how we we, we are burning. We are. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> but, but but I mean, no, it's a it's a it's a. Yeah, everyone's driving their own car. It's it's offensive, you know. So I mean, I, yes, we're a small nation, and we have we we. But we that's that's always my complaint is that we're a small place. We could get this under control. Like I mean, this is a population of let's say four hundred thousand people. There's so much we could do. But but um yeah, but the green yeah the green thing, uh, to green tourism is what you're discussing. Yeah, yeah. but I mean. If we can't live green, why can't we live green? Like, what is stopping us? Um, because we but we we have consumed an American lifestyle. We just completely we aspire to uh, c that consumerist American lifestyle. Like, so it's just not. You'd have to. You have. You, you know what? We would. We would have to hit some serious poverty again. Go back to the 1920s. You know, before tourism. And people really not have the, the 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 money that they have now to spend and waste. And um, I mean, I, I'm I'm guilty as well. I'm not saying I'm I'm no angel. I'm, you know, I, I I because I have no choice when I'm here. But when I'm in when I live in other places and I can recycle, I recycle. I'll use public transport, and and we can all consume less. But uh, let's not go too far down that. No, but <laughs> but I mean, transportation is definitely a challenge, and that is one of the huge challenges is how we perceive transportation do we do we perceive transportation as a necessary that all people need all bodies need or is it something that is outside of us because again it goes to to the leisure aesthetic mm -hmm. it's it challenges the the undergirding that is there so people land they're taken to a place or a space that used to be a hotel is now a resort and the resort now sits outside the community no longer within the community if you remember a lot of the old hotels were pretty much in the communities mm -hmm. and they were you know, abandoned and we are not having those kinds of conversations about how property is abandoned left and never reused, even though it can be reused within that same structure. You don't need to tear it down and, and revitalize it. You can redesign that same space, but the resort removed itself. It went over to somewhere else that was not here. So it's, it's an outsourcing of land to a private entity that in many ways no longer belongs to us, but we work for it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know. So the the green is is a part I think of that. What's also interesting talking about resorts is how quite a few companies have now just taken islands because they like they don't even want to be in the actual Bahamas anymore. They want to have an island where they can create a version of the Bahamas that they want their tourists to experience. And there's not even an interaction with, in fact, anyone who lives a normal life here. I think that's kind of like the ultimate, right? And that, yeah, that is the kind of thing I'd, I'd like you. Can we discuss that? Can we, because again, if you look at the way public transportation is not really public, it doesn't move people. If I work at Lyford, I have to get the bus that leaves at X time, 
gets there at X time. It probably takes longer nowadays because there's so much more traffic. But that says something about the way we think. We have never joined up these communities. So if I work downtown and I live in Carmichael, boy, if I'm not on that five o'clock bus, my behind is, is in trouble because the last bus probably leaves at 5.30 from East Street South to get down to Carmichael. Otherwise, you have to take a taxi. So the, the entire economy is structured around that whole fiction that we're talking about. Yeah, but I mean, the, uh, my, our, well, I, don't, I can't speak for everyone, but our entire lives have been structured around the hotels. I mean, mm -hmm. like if I remember, like when I was growing up, the only entertainment would be if me and some friends could catch a ride and kind of try to get into the swimming pools at, at the hotels on Paradise Island or, and uh, like there were, there was only one movie theater at the time. So you could, you, you know, you could find entertainment at the hotels, concerts were held. So our engagements, like I remember after church on a Sunday, we would go and walk around in the casino and like kind of promenade huh. around like you know the, so i think that we don't realize how integral the hotels are to our existence so i know you're talking about kind of like you know bahama and 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 the different hotels they become the hubs the jitneys have to run through them so if you try to get to certain parts of the island it's impossible by jitney because they don't connect to those hotels so i mean these things all dictate the the way we live and then then yeah i mean and then i get in my own work like when you go into those spaces those visuals then we're continually consuming these fantasy visuals like i mean come on like uh, you know we forget atlantis apparently rose from the ocean mm. and in the bahamas and <laughs> and we go in there and it's sea monsters and you know it, it's it's an artwork it's a sea monsters and kind of like these diving suits and you know like it's it's this mystery fantasy space and that that's the problem is that we're all kind of living in this this fantasy space and it, and it is because we're also in and out of the hotels i mean there's probably not a person a, a bahamian who hasn't worked in the tourist industry like I, I mean everyone i know has had some job in in, in it's, it's interesting like you said when you go into the to that sector what is expected of you you're performing a, a particular role within the tourism industry within somebody's imagination of what tourism is about. So, you know, your body becomes your penis, becomes a part of somebody else's pleasure. It's dreadful of me to say wanna, that. I just want to actually also draw attention to the fact that we're sitting on a hotel property right now. So I think it would be disingenuous to not mention that, especially for people that might be watching this from somewhere else, um, is that we're sitting here like being hypercritical. But in fact, we as, as a space have also you know, chosen. I mean, it was also just a space we found, but we're on a hotel property, and and it and it benefits us because mm -hmm. we get people coming in here who would not otherwise. Because if we had a gallery space downtown, which I would love to do, and again, ten years at NAGB, getting people to go downtown to consume art is almost an impossible task, um, unless people are already super engaged in art. But if you're just like, oh, well, come down see a show, no, that's not going to happen. And, uh, and we knew that being on this property would mean we got a certain kind of foot traffic because people are coming here to use the cinema and like specifically what you're speaking to. Mm -hmm. um, and that all of us have grown up, like the hotel is where you go to prom, the hotel is where you go to a wedding, the hotel is where you go to a baptism, the hotels, I mean, right, we've all been to weddings and hotel conference rooms. And, uh, and that's like a really normal part of our existence. And so it's really hard because, again, as a business, we, we had that whole conversation. Where do we want to be? Um, and, you know, we thought, okay, let's be here while we set, set up our name. Hopefully when we're better known, we can be somewhere else and people will come. But you're kind of trapped by it as well. Like you said, okay. Blue, you kind of get trapped into it because you see it and you don't want to be part of it. But then you're like, you know, so it's a sort of vicious circle. So I just wanted to say that because I think to sit here and criti critique it and not be very transparent about where we are would also be just disingenuous. Blue, any comment? <laughs> no? Okay. No, I agree. I think it is. The, the challenge is that we are not changing. I mean, yes, the world is changing. Tourism is changing. 
the pleasure industry or the leisure industry is changing, the demise of Thomas Cook alone will, will tell us that it's changing. But we are not changing because we're not necessarily, I don't know if we're not allowed to change or if we are so trapped in a paradigm that we can't see the need to change. But I mean, I think your work really speaks to that in, because it deconstructs so many things and throws, uh, throws up so many symbols of hyperrealism, but also of dis disparate, just disparate realities, disparate miscouplings. And so, like the, the cement mixer with the sunscreen in it or the sunblock in it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's in a lot of ways, it's very discordant, but it's also very real. That is how, that's what our construction industry is based on, right? So. Sorry, just because. Hi, good evening, everyone. So I was thinking, when you talked about the fantasy land, I was reading um, James Baldwin on one of his last last conversations. Real, and I think. Um, when you when you think about um, the way that language is used, I don't think we often understand how the very words that we're using continues to perpetuate the fantasy that we often have to deal with. I think for someone like me, who, like, I don't know, um, I think in the... Con Understanding that the, the systematic structure that we live in is not totalizing in that um, you often see in movies, if I could, I, I'm trying to connect thoughts. Sorry for, sorry for jumping. Um, there's so much going on. Um, you know, like in movies where you often see where um, there's this plot to like take over everyone's minds and they succeed in taking over most of the people, but there are these one, these few people who it doesn't work on. That kind of concept. It's like that. When you're like, that, when, you're, when you're the person where um, the fantasy that's been drummed up doesn't really appeal to you and it doesn't it doesn't move you, it doesn't draw you in and you see it for what it is. It's hard to live in this space in particular and have like and think about having a great quality of life because everyone you're in network in is literally tied to that fantasy mm -hmm. so much that it that that even when you you're trying to distance yourself or even escape from it, it comes after you. Right. And it's like it's this insidious joy James talks about. It's like it, it hunts you because it, it's wanting to it, it, even if you get away from the fantasy, it wants to keep sucking you in. Mm -hmm. So it's going back to like the Matrix, the blue pill, red pill thing. Right. Is that if you continue on this particular pathway, and I think that that's what your work is speaking to. Right. That the these aesthetics, they become. They they be like they take they take hold of our minds in ways that I don't think we often recognize, and um, it takes a lot of work, um, like for people just to get out of there. So you talk about change. I'm thinking about how it is very difficult to get people to change who um, they can't see past. They can't even recognize the the ideology or the, the language in which they're trapped in, because in order to get out the trap, right? And this, I think it's, this goes back to the way that oppression is structured. In order to get out the trap, you have to be able to name the structure in which you're trapped in, right? Which takes language. Um, and then afterwards, you have to be able to continuously name the, name, name the ongoing process as you move away from it. And that hurts. Like psychologically, that puts you in like just weird, like it's a very, it's a lonely, difficult path. And um, again, James, he says that you can't escape. We cannot escape what we've done. Either you pay for it willingly or you pay for it unwillingly. And I don't know that for me, it speaks to like how like life often puts you, puts when you've made decisions 
and put, and they put you in this very difficult position and you're like, well, how did I end up here? Um, it goes back to this, um, I, I don't know. I was thinking about it as, I hate to think of it as submitting, but it's like you have to go through the process and relinquish any kind of control to obtain the kind of change that you're really necessarily looking for. Um, hopefully that makes sense. But yeah, it's, I don't know, it's just a lot that I'm thinking of. So again, it goes back to this idea of, I, I often fluctuate between this very, this serious, very pessimistic, like reality that things may never change. I may die and things never change. Here in the Bahamas, that's a sad, like that's a, it's sad. And then other times you alternate where you're like, okay, there's hope. There's a smidgen of hope. And it's like, I really want, I mean, I think all of us, when you live in a space, um, for, for when Dr. Bethel Bennett talks about how disconnected it is, it finally, well, it finally, it, it hit for me, right? In that you see the segregation work, not just through transit, but the way that um, that particular food markets are, are structured, the way that that certain spaces in the Bahamas operate as food deserts, right? And we don't even see that, right? Because in order for me to get good quality produce, I have to drive um, all all the way up here out, out east, um, and 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 even then, like you like you you see how everything is structured in a way to continuously perpetuate this fantasy. Um, like it's just, it's just very consuming. So, yeah. Thank you, Natina. Thank you. You do? So a comment came in and said, the society is so reliant on external help, not just with tourism, but also with imports. As long as we have this over-reliance, it would be hard for the Bahamas to move outside of that system. There was an there was an entire discussion going on a few days ago on online with the way that the economy has been structured by the WTO, the World Bank, the IMF, that is basically invisible to most people because they don't inhabit those worlds where those things matter. But every day we are impacted by those. It, so when whatever decision we make determines our relationship with the IMF, or they determine whatever decision we make, not necessarily in producing art, but even there, like we were talking about what we produce for government to consume is about tourism and not necessarily anything that does not depict a particular stereotypical trope of tourism or for tourism. The, um, so when I talk about the IMF, the reality that they hold the purse strings to the country does not come up. But you can see that, or I can see that, sorry, me. Let me personalize this. I can see that in your art because I'm aware of that. I've worked in Washington. I, I get that. I've worked on policy. And this isn't to sound like I know what I'm talking about. This is just to sound like I've been in spaces where you have to be aware of these things because they impact how you, how you live. They impact how you respond. And it is interesting that, and Amanda said it, many of many parts of our economy are now externalized in terms of islands. But the, the hotel companies are no longer owned by hotel companies or the hotel properties or the resort properties. Are mo this is a unique establishment. A lot of the other ones are now owned by funds or um, investment corporations or groups that actually are just there to make money for their investors they're not they don't care about hospitality or tourism this is a bahamian owned hotel that is tie it's rooted 
it's rooted within a particular space and within a within a particular culture it may attract people in but more of the money stays in the economy than say i can't even remember what the name of the investment corporation is that runs atlantis now <laughs> but it's it's how do we as people relate to that are we on the standing on our individual conch shells and feeling isolated or oh lord i threw I... because it also relates to how we see ourselves i mean atlantis has really embraced bahamian culture or at least it had i don't know if it's still doing the whole bahamian cultural thing so that was a shift from the earlier epoch of just being the, the land that comes up out of the water in the Bahamas. That has nothing to do with the Bahamas, as Krista talks about in her work. But I think that your work really throws light on that in, in interesting ways. And you know, living between New Providence and Paradise Island, with on that bridge because we go back and forth like you said so many so many things happen in those hotels we would go to pastiche you, you, i was gonna say i hope you're not too young for pastiche or or le, le pont. <laughs> yeah le pont. and so this is like you said this is where our our entertainment was was found yeah I mean, there, there. I understand what you what what you're getting at. With that. I mean, the, the the smaller hotel spaces. The I mean, I, I guess the the, the 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 hotel corporations. Yes, all of the money is funneled out of the Bahamas. So we blood, sweat, and tears go into it. We sing and dance to the stereotypes. Nothing's really going to change. They don't want anything to change. We don't know how to change it. So, but I do think that smaller uh, entities like the hotel that we're in, um, you know, the, the staff here seem to have a great deal of auto autonomy right. and don't and, and aren't performing any specific roles. Like, let's say, you know, I, you know, they seem very Bahamian to me, like uh, that. Whereas when I worked in the in, in Crystal Palace, everybody, we could all code switch at the drop of a hat. You know, you'd go from speaking in dialect to speaking in the twangiest American accent for tourists and you know and like you and i i did it as well like i mean you just kind of um you have to play the role so yeah i mean there's the hope that um uh, but that that smaller entities you know smaller hotels would be healthier for us but we already have these massive hotels that mm -hmm. are that employ more people than the government i mean mm -hmm. how do you you've already sold sold your soul to the devil how do you undo these these things like I mean and and I I don't you know of course we hotels ever since the beginning like I, I remember in I used to before the National Gallery of the Bahamas I used to go and walk around in the hotel in Paradise Island to see John Beadle works to see Jackson Burnside works that was where my first experience with Bahamian art was so I mean that's pretty deep if you think about it like that and I used to go on the regular to do that and to see these uh, and to see bahamian art it was the only place i could go so it's like well and so i know that you know say a place like bahamar has this big investment in bahamian culture but of course i'm very critical of that because the freedom for bahamian artists to really express themselves still cannot happen in a touristic space you are still performing for the tourists who happen to be coming in and i mean and and they do do very adventurous things there but you can't have a, a critical art session where you're critiquing each other's work in that space and in a space which is also one of the biggest art buyers right now to decorate the hotel rooms and and to do different things so it's like well what we still need are all of our grassroots spaces which are practically all gone now where it is just, you know, local artists engaging with each other. And um, yeah, so the hotel space is always going to be 
performed and 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 that's my other problem like locally i think that we're just treading water artistically because um we're, it's nobody is going to make that really adventurous work we all have to survive so mm -hmm. On one hand, I, I get it. You might be painting your pictures of the beach over here, but at the same time, why aren't you doing the experimental work over here? And that's what a lot of us in my generation, when we were coming up, were doing. On one hand, you were making some screen prints, some T-shirts. That stuff made the money, and then we were organizing our own shows. And so I guess my big worry, or it has always been, that with, with moves for the hotels to absorb our art communities, that's what happened to the local music scene yes. in the Bahamas, yeah, yeah. that we used to have lots of small little clubs. I mean, mm -hmm. this predates me. I'm not that old, you know, <laughs> so, you know. Are where, you making like, fun of my age now? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you can speak to this, but we used to have quite a scene of local venues and people would, pe pe people would come from New York to go to these little <laughs> venues and it was a happening scene. And then the hotels decided, well, our guests are leaving. They're spending on drinks here, there, and everywhere, and not in our places. So they built their own theaters, took the artists in, and then the artists were playing Yellow Bird and Brown Girl in the Ring, and it's a limbo fire dance. And so I, I well, it's the truth. And so yeah, that's yeah, yeah. this move that's, that's happened now, that the hotels are investing in art. It, a lot has happened, but I think we have to be very aware and i guess my i i was very concerned like i you can walk through a certain hotel and there are kind of priceless works from the 1920s right behind the customer service desk mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the girl is just backing up her chair against that i i i approached her and i said do not put your chair on that painting so my i just get worried that, that like again so now where are we going like is it does I, can, I i can't believe that another generation of bohemians would have to go into a hotel to but, see that work of art sorry that, but but it's 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 true i mean i i agree with you so because i go there and i also like see things happening and i'm like there's a the catering event and they're bumping up against and i'm like ah! and, and as a, just a visitor but the problem is is that where where is anyone else stepping up? Because even like the energy is awesome, we know the energy is awesome, but it's, it still doesn't have the capacity uh, to do specific things. And I mean, one thing that's like a deep concern right now is that um, there's a massive collection, right? A very important Bohemian collection, who I think most of us probably know which one it is. And the, the person who, is, who has that collection is getting older and is really concerned about what's gonna happen when they pass. Because there's nowhere to leave it. And it's like, who's going to step up? Should it be University of the Bahamas? Should it be the government? Should there be a national museum? There have been these conversations for so long. And there's no, no one stepping up. And so the, while I agree with you about the hotel, it's like, may, you know, they're the only ones like spending the money right now. And, and, I don't, and I don't agree necessarily agree with it, but it's like we need a facility to take care of this, those those works and to be able to have the capacity to do that so it's it's really like this awful again it's awful catch-22 that you don't want it to happen but you're like well if it's going to end up in a basement getting mold on it maybe just as well be on a hotel wall and that's the, the you know it's the awful the, the horrible awful truth right now sorry i don't mean to <laughs> jump in but i think it goes back to that thing about um the brain drain aspect of it where the hotel then employs all of the people who um, have the education or don't have the education. And I think that when you have spaces or when you come from a space that, you know, doesn't give, doesn't impart agency on persons that does not allow space for experimentation, even in the outside realms that doesn't trust you know, because I think that there is money around. There are people that want to step up. There are people who are doing things on their own. And I see like June in the back there, you know what I mean? Um, who has a gallery downtown, who has been doing like things in the community. Sorry, June. But, you know, but there has, has been like different like grassroots organizations, people like coming up, people trying to make something stick. But because there's this like internal, um, Th this inherent distrust in one another that we don't then support one another to then say, okay, well, we'll 
build you up to do the thing. And I think that, um, you know, spaces like like pop up and spaces like hillside and spaces like don't collect they need that cash injection they have been like mm -hmm. um over and over again like proven themselves to be spaces that could possibly you know rise to the occasion but they they have stepped up you know i think that they have shown that we could do this they have shown that we like invest in like um the the ecosystem and ecology of it all but then um when the money is handed out on the table or you know, we realize that one machine has it all and then that one machine then consumes it all. And I think that I've watched in real time being in college when Bahama first started, when Bahama legit was like, we have a shit ton of money. We mm -hmm. give us your proposals, make, and people did make the experimental work. They did make the critical work. They mm -hmm. did make the ambitious work. They did propose these things, you know? And I watched in real time how, because of how monies are being allocated to certain projects and persons who are considered and all that sort of stuff. And this is not um, a critique on the initial team because I know it doesn't like start and stop with them. Um, I watched in real time how our art making change, how because Bahama was operating in a specific way, other spaces then couldn't operate in that same way. Or they, um, or they tried to take advantage of that as well. And then it just became like this machine that hunts <laughs> and pulls and like, you know, sucks in the focus. But what I don't think happened was that, I think what the flip side of that and the flip side of the, to this, um, this ecology, these sustainable um, markets that you're talking about, or the places that could even like, um, what's the word? Somebody has to want to be poor. Somebody has to want to, you know, not make the money. Someone has to not want to, you know, and then is that really something that we could ask out of such a small ecosystem and ecology of people to martyr themselves in that way just for the sake of this thing? Um, so, yeah, yeah. For sure. You know, even the public spaces, and this is, believe me, the, the work I'm doing is, is really distressing and disturbing and, and high and insightful, but it is distressing to see how public space, what we could construe as public space, is removed from the public just in terms of what the public space can do, what the commons can do to produce culture. And that culture is then managed by a small capital fund that does not necessarily share nicely or play nicely with others. So exactly what you're saying, and I, my research is showing me how that really took off after the 1960s, because the hotels realized that they could capitalize on the market that had been created by Funky Nassau, by Eloise, by a, a really vibrant downtown Nassau that, was, that served a particular kind of, of clientele. Now, there are always going to be problems. I mean, there's no way of getting around the problems. But I, I keep thinking of the... Haitian realist, magical realism, and the Faulknerian marvelous realism, and the way that these things intertwine, and challenging why that has not developed here in the same way. Like, how is it that even our over the hill communities are being erased by? the, I don't even want to call it the gentrification because that's too mild a word, the outsourcing of, of the commons. I, nobody's going to touch that one. <laughs> but because when you have an over-the-hill space that produces culture, even though it doesn't realize it's producing culture, it is then taken over by something else. to say you know what we talked about what you talked about in the beginning was like self and you talk about it like we are, we are doing it to ourselves right 
Um, and when over the hill, one of the things that frustrated me so much when I was at the NGB was I would, you know, very often just go out in the road and like watch, watch how people moved in the city. Like, where should I have a pedestrian crosswalk? And, you know, where should I have a sign? And without fail, um, people, not Bahamians, obviously, we're talking about tourists now, would walk up the hill and then want, to, want to go over. And the defense force officers at government house or the police officers that were used to be stationed on West Hill Street would actively stop people and say, don't go there. And it's happened to me because people always assume I'm a tourist that like, I was like walking from Hillside house one night, going back to NHB to get my car. And some guy crosses the street and he's like, ma'am, ma'am, you shouldn't be here. Like, what are you doing here? You know, so it's like eight o'clock on a Tuesday night. And I was like, it's okay. I, you know, don't worry about it. I'm from here. Let me walk you. I'm like, that's really fine. So, you know, we, we'd stop and people from also going. And then even as, even when you are over the hill, the amount of times I've been stopped by police officers. Um, yeah, We're, you know, and so, what, what are you doing here? You got it, you got it. Sorry. That's fine. Um, most of the times, like, especially if you live in, like, what you would say, over the hill, you know the difference between tourists and your local um, persons. So definitely you would be targeted, especially during that time of the night. Crime is at an all-time high. Of course, yeah. So. <laughs> no, I mean, again, I, I, I understand that, like, again, especially at night, you know, so, but, but, um, so I'm not saying, but. I think even in the daytime to stop, there's a, there's an element of shame, right? Like if you're stopping economy from going over and you're stopping any kind of local development. So I think it would be very easy to have something like the old, um, what was it called? You know, the place, I mean, the old cultural village. Um, the Jumbe. Gumbe, yeah, Jumbe village, exactly. And in the fact that everything's been like pushed back over to downtown or pushed back. So it's just, it's just like, no, don't go there. Like nothing good happens there. And I'm not, belittling the, the the situation and the amount of crime there is but again like if you have more people going to a space have more people walking and walking on the sidewalk it be, actually also becomes safer so there's, there's lots of studies that show that you know that if you create a uh, more activity um there's less opportunity right the scariest places to be are places that are like empty at night where everyone's staying inside because they don't want to go outside or if, if there's like activity and people walking and things happening it's actually less easy to commit crime. So it's kind of like, again, we're always like talking about this catch 22. Um, so yeah, but uh, no, but again, you know, I'm talking about in the daytime, but I, I have done community work in the daytime and police officers will stop you and say like, what are you doing here? Um, people like you are only here to buy weed. So go, go back to where you came from, you know, and that's, and it's kind of like, okay, no, I've actually at my friend's house. <laughs> like, um, so it's, it's just a, it's complicated. So I think, well, two points. Um, so when, when I think about, because you talk about the crime element, right? So I think about how space is then imbued with this kind of, the space itself, not the people. The space itself, which the people inhabit, is then imbued with this kind of um, status as being criminalized, right? Um, and because, yes, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. See, right. But 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 that's I but that's how that's how space is reorganized even in the fantasy, right? Space is reorganized in that way in that um, it it um, it's othered the the space itself is othered in a way that marginalizes it that 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 that, that positions it as this 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 threat that if you go there as you were talking about there's harm going to be um, enacted on you. And I think that the, there's a disconnect between how the fantasy itself is creating that space, right? By, ex by, just, ex yeah. by, by just existing, yeah. right? Yeah. Going, back, going back to the, the machine, right? It's this, so again, I think, and then I think about, you know, so, so I think about that. And then I think about Jody, when you mentioned um, the martyrdom, 
I, I want to challenge that, that conceptualization because I, I want to say, and I want to say that, because I've been wrestling with that kind of idea of whether or not it's actually a martyrdom. And could it be that the, that the fantasy has positioned um, that kind of activity as this kind of martyrdom just simply because only a very few people are doing it and are successful in it? So it feels as if, you know, if we ask them to make this kind of, uh, of, of, of I don't want to say, um, commit, yes, commitment to this, right? That somehow... Um, we're asking more of them than is necessary or required to live. And in cases, I guess you can argue that in some cases where, where people are literally like um, in deep poverty, that may be the case. But I, what I've been working with is this idea that you can, um, which Foucault um, talks about, and, and, and there have been other um, scholars that have posited this, that um, liberation is achievable, right? But it has to be achieved through resistance. So if you resist, then you can liberate yourself. But, and, there, and, and by resisting, you extend your agency. You don't wait for it to be given to you. By making decisions that culminate in you achieving more freedom from oppression, you then come into a kind of state of liberation where the obstacles that used to inhibit you can no longer inhibit you, if that makes sense. Yeah. Sorry, I have a question because I just like looking at the time, but I'm very curious to know, um, Blue, what is, because I know that your practice has, has a way where it like, I think I told you like it remixes itself, it represents yourself itself like over time. Um, how have you thought about what the next representation of leisure aesthetics would be? And then how has showing this work here after so long like informed like what you're conceptualizing and tinkering with for something else in London. <laughs> I, don't, um, I, I guess I, I kind of wanted to speak a bit to what you had said earlier uh, as, as well. Um, but um, in in terms of this idea of a martyr, martyr, um, and that, um, but it, uh, referencing kind of like the creative community, and so of course the problem is. If you're not making work which suits predominantly the tourist market, then you're not going to make a living. So if you want to make work that's not going to sell, like kind of a bit like my work is, then you're a martyr because you know that you, and if you don't have another way to survive, you're not going to be able to do it because there's going to be no support. But we have to uh, develop our own ecosystem of local art galleries, buyers, the, the whole system to support that. And then people, artists will not feel that they have to make work that could sell locally, but let me put a palm tree in because a tourist might buy it too. And I mean, and I'm not, I, I'm not knocking anybody for that, that people need to pay the bills. And so, uh, you know, like, so how do you, and the, you, we just have to develop our own local a healthy ecosystem for art that some people will continue to service the tourist industry. And we know the stereotypical images and, you know, like they're still going to be painting like it's 1930, no phone poles, you know, like, you know, dog in the street and, you know, and, and horse and carriage. But that, but we, we, you know, I, I realized that like, all right, I left 20 years ago because I just couldn't find the support for the work that I was doing. That's one of the reasons. Um, and so it's great to find to come back now and find that people are still are interested in what I'm doing and that a gallery like this would take it on and have a solo presentation. And the NAGB has been very supportive of me over the years. But that, like, how do we, 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 we just have to make it so that a young artist coming up doesn't care what an outside audience thinks of the work that they're making. But right now, whether we're aware or not, we, we all really care, you know. Um, so that, that would be, that, that's kind of like, um, so I, I get it that, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you, you, you do, if you decide you're going to do work like, I mean, like there, but we have had artists who have done that work, like, like say, I, I saw him yesterday, but like someone like Clive Stewart, has always made like really controversial work, which can never be, it can never fit 
in and i've i've always respected him for that because uh, clive will uh, you know make some really hard hitting work and it's very local and um no it's yeah, it, 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 yeah, <laughs> you know, and so I, I, I'm not, there, there are some people, but you do have to be a martyr. And like, if you look at Clive in terms of career locally, yeah. he probably sold very little work. He's had to teach and be in education. And, and, and so you do have to be a martyr to an extent as things currently are. But let's just, like my, going back to the kind of Bahamar brain drain is, I mean, straight up, the reason we lost pop-up is because of Bahamar. The reason why a lot of spaces closed and even the NAGB suffered a huge uh, loss it's because they sucked in all of the smart, active people and artists. And, and so we have to kind of just say like spaces like the one that Tessa Whitehead started um, and, 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 and others. Huh? What well, well, for Bahamar? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but, of course but, they have they but, have the money, but I'm I'm saying that like on the side, we we all still need to try to have the side hustle, to have our local like don't let things shut down because Bahamar sell sell your paintings for a hundred thousand dollars to Bahamar, but still have your local art community and still be hustling like like your space is doing and and um. But we I feel like we're kind of at a, a low moment for local art spaces and local art collectives. I, I think that that local art low moment is, is designed into being. I, I, and you hit on that. But the economics of it, the, so, the sociology of it, or the psychosocial of it is really important. We don't ever touch on the psychosocial of what the art does or how it does it or the role that art plays within not just the local community or the small community, but within the mental community, within the, the intellectual community. As somebody who grew up here in the 1970s, there was a vibrant theater. It may have been small, it may have been not Hollywood, but it was so vibrant, and people were involved. And people went. One and also, people and, went. And, it was, and, and you didn't get mug parking a car there. So again, that's also part of the problem. Is that is again this, this the sucking of the life into the hotels made yes. made the city unsafe because yeah. we remember when we went out downtown and walked around like, yep. all the time and like went went play, you know again it was super normal, and the sucking of the life into the hotels made the city unsafe. Um, but what I was going to say to that was that I agree with you about. Um, the sucking of the kind of brain, but at the same time, what I, and I think that's what Jody's speaking to as someone's got to sort of mar themselves is, yes, the, the people that were making pop-up happen got sucked into Bahamar, but where were the people that then stepped up to take over a pop-up? And it is an interesting, it is an interesting like uh, phenomenon. I just went to, I just went to um, uh, El Salvador on a, on a curatorial trip. And, and I was in San Salvador, which is a city of you know, several million people. And uh, the country is, you know, 14 million. What, I don't know the numbers, but it's a lot. It's a lot of people. It's millions. And the capital of, of El Salvador, San Salvador, has one museum, which is privately owned by a very wealthy collector. Um, so no national museum, no galleries, no commercial galleries. Um, but a really vibrant uh, collect, like artist collective scene, and so it makes you think a lot about wealth and and you know what that does. Um, so the, the the a lot of art collectives like really, you know, pushing it because there's not a commercial scene. But then you're here and there's like quite a good commercial scene and there's quite a. But then suddenly that kind of like kills off the. Well, I want to I want to work. So for, you know, it, I want to make my own space, and so it's it's kind of a weird observation and you you kind of mention it a little bit when you talk about carnival in trinidad it's um because carnival has developed as its own entity and Trini trinidadian culture has developed its own personality within the trini ecosystem and it could mean something different outside i don't know but in puerto rico it is a similar kind of thing and I keep wondering what happened that makes or has made us so different because Dorian hit, right? 
Maria hit Puerto Rico in 2017. The, the earthquakes came right after, but the resilience was incredible because there's still spots popping up and there's still this, I don't want to call it underground because it's not really underground, but there's still this economic machine that is able to support local arts and artists and, and cultural practitioners that we seem to have turned our back on. I don't know, I don't know where that chip, the computer chip went awry. Well, I guess I would, I would have a, a, a few things to say. I mean, I, when people talk to me outside of the Bahamas, quite frequently they ask me, you know, like, how many artists come from the Bahamas and the rest of it. Look, creativity and actually talent, it really is a numbers game. Yeah. Out of four, a population of 400,000, if in one generation there are six amazing artists, that's, that's a lot. That's mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. So when you say, like, where were the people to step up to take over pop-up, I'm like, Bahama literally took everyone. Like, they're in a population, it's just like, I think creativity and that willing to be a bit of a martyr and to be an outlier, it, it, the, we are a small place. So you're not just gonna say, other people aren't just gonna say, oh, hey, there's a space there for me. Well, no, I, I, I'm really a believer that there are limited, there, there are a limited number of fools like us <laughs> who will be creative. So when you speak of Trinidad, it's like, well, that's a population yeah, that's a big, of millions. Yeah, yeah. You talk about Puerto Rico, Population, population of millions. Like, so I okay. just think immediately that the, there, are there are more people who can do it, um, you know, and um, so. But. No, not no, not at all. No, no, no criticism. Yeah, yeah. To, to, but but I. But it's like, it's it's interesting because what you what you're saying and you're both all of us are talking about is when you suck the air out of a system, you basically kill the system. But you, the system doesn't know it's dead yet because there you are managing the airflow. It's like when you put somebody who has died on that thing that that keeps them alive, that it doesn't, it doesn't actually keep them alive. It, it stops them from dying all over again. But why, it's, it's an artificial life. It's not, it, it, it ain't real, it's a fiction, it's a confabulation as somebody in the room says. But it's also about, and the, same, the, the body in the room says, how do you manage to be in a structure that is so toxic and stay there. You know, I'm not talking about Bahama being toxic. I'm talking about some of the structures are incredibly toxic. And I, I look at the way the colonial attitude has determined and designed so many of the structures that we inhabit. Is if, but, but again, you have to have, Ramai talked about, you have to be willing to pay that price. We have six. Hmm. six minutes. Jody is Jody is determined that we have six minutes. Questions? Any questions or comments? Blue? Yeah. Oh, jeez. Okay. That, 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 uh, uh, so, can I be wicked? Oh, go, go for it. May I, please? Yes, be wicked. You have caps on the wall here. Mm -hmm. The leisure aesthetic. Yeah, this is sort of a, a branding of the brand. <laughs> so, yeah. So, no, I imagine that this is a, a side project continues. So, I mean, yes, the exhibition is called Leisure Aesthetics, Leisure Aesthetics, but, um, but I imagine that the branding of that goes into other limited edition objects so it's sort of a an offshoot that that perhaps will will continue will continue yeah um, uh, other than my own i mean it is 
part of my practice and my sculpture <laughs> as well. Yeah. But the, um, so that's sort of a, a, a side thing. Yeah. Are they available? I mean, what, how? It's a it's, position of 10, yes. Okay. So. <laughs> so yes, the hats are a limited edition, but it, again, it's, it's, it's kind of cheeky and tongue in cheek. So, I mean, but yeah, so it's a limited edition. So it will appear, maybe you'll get a red hat with a green thing, or maybe you'll get like the picture of the black hat. Or it'll move into other, uh, other products. But, but I, I like yeah. this idea that even the, 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 the idea of it can then be branded and put right back onto mm -hmm. the materials again, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, a, a, so, but, yeah, but actually, just, I also think within, we only got six minutes. If you would, I mean, the idea that that is an artwork and that that costs X amount of money, um, might people might come in and scratch their heads. But people are buying Balenciaga sneakers that are made in editions of a hundred, you know, fifty thousand for uh, for God knows how many hundreds of thousands of dollars. But suddenly, when we say, "Oh, that's art," people are like, "What?" <laughs> so yeah, it's a limited edition. Comes in ten, um, so only ten will ever appear in black with pink. Done. So are they individually set? <laughs> so, are, they, are, are they on sale individually? Sounds like a, sounds like a uh, at your local right. tone gallery? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah. I mean, I, so, um, yes. Like, I mean, like, this is the first, like, like uh, the concept store 1.0. Like, you know, they're, they're, uh, I've worked with the term leisure aesthetics for a long time, so now it's like it's nice to see it turn into a product uh, that like just I mean all of the work I just keep kind of like doubling back on myself and layering up, and I think that that in that kind of um, layering up that hopefully people will see will reassess some of the materials, some of the ideas, and I mean there like you said that some people will never have the distance from it to understand like what I'm trying to get at by rejigging these materials and I'm presenting them in a different way. Um, but uh, that's, that, that, that's the, uh, yeah. <laughs> so when should we look for the part two? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm putting you on the spot. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, it's been a busy year. Let it's been know. a bit. It, it has been a busy year. You're quite right. I love. I love that. I'll say he is flying. He leaves this show um, on Monday and going to Documenta again to complete uh, that project. So that's where he'll be next. Is in Germany in Kassel. And for those that don't know, who might be listening, Documenta is like this kind of every five year huge art show which is sort of you know again like very important in the art world and sort of says like what's happening now it's kind of what's on the pulse so he was in a collaborative um project with alice yard from trinidad uh, yeah. uh heine schmidt also was there and so it was they had they had a space that every two weeks was being taken over by another artist who had a residency in alice yard and these islands were were also he was also producing those there and so there'll be different okay. ones um happening so he's going to go from here straight to germany to to close out that project um there was something i wanted you to speak to briefly on on that um i i wanted because the the mixer came up i wanted you to be able to speak to the fact that you're in this show in new york now as well right the uh, uh, tropical political yes, show. Yeah, there are a few Bahamian artists in it, um, and it's uh, kind of uh, discussing uh, exactly this: how tourism has affected uh, uh, Caribbean societies. Tropical is political. Tropical yeah. is political. Is that what they said? Yeah, yeah. Tropical is political. Yeah. Um, so the work, the, um, the 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 flag pieces behind us, they were originally. Uh, done as a commission uh, about eight years ago for Site Santa Fe um, in New Mexico, and there were 40 of those flags. They were each um, uh, each flag represented one of the cruise ships that comes into port in Nassau. And during the exhibition, um, flags were raised and lowered. So if if seven ships were in the port here in Nassau, seven flags, beach towel flags, were hanging um, from the uh, the flagpole on the outside of the gallery. 
So it was a, it was an interactive work. It was a changing sculpture, and they also we also had a live video feed um, of the port and the ships in port uh, in the gallery. So people would see the flagpole outside, but then they could also make the correlation between mm. what was going on in Nassau, and you could watch it online. So I, I viewed the the port at that time as a sculptural installation that kept changing, but then the flagpole was also another installation. So, um, so since then I've continued creating the, the, the flags, um, but, but the original series is yeah, currently on show in New York. And then that will go to Puerto Rico, um, uh, at the end of the year, I think. Um, so, um, uh, Dion Benjamin Smith is Dave Smith. Smith. That's yeah. It. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a, a good selection from across the Caribbean. Um, but yeah, great that yeah, there yeah. are, uh, four Bahamian and Bahamian related artists in the show. Uh, so that, that's, that's going on as well. So, so that you're asking me like, what's next? I'm like, wait, I, I, yeah, I, like I know it's like, yeah, it's spinning. I, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. There's enough going on for now. Um, yeah. <laughs> definitely. It's been a pleasure. Well, I hope I haven't been too boring. Um, we are one minute over. Were Jody's there, going there any, to any other, questions? any other questions or comments? No. Let, let, let's off some, camera. Let's off have some camera. Coffee and drinks. Co uh, drinks. And the show's open until October twenty second. For anyone that wasn't able to come to the opening or could miss the talk in person, so you can come back and see that. And we're open Tuesday through Saturday, every day ten to six. Uh, so yeah, so come to turn and see Blue's awesome show. And thank you both. <laughs>